Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Maureen O'Connor from Quilters Heaven in Northbrook, Illinois, and I am the Opinionated Quilter. Today's episode is math. Don't roll your eyes. If you think you can't do Quilters math, I promise you can. It's easy. I'm going to show you how. But before we get to that, let's start with my customer who gives me her scraps. This past week, she came in with these leftover strip sets from a project that she had done. And I know exactly what I'm going to do with it for a Project Linus quilt. I'd love to hear what you folks would all do with it if somebody walked in and gave you it. So hopefully next week I'll show you what I've done to make a Project Linus quilt. It's come to my attention that people are conflating a diagonally set quilt, which is commonly called on point, with taking a square block and putting triangles around it and calling that block set on point. Here is a square block that you can put triangles on, and here's one, and people will call this set on point. This is a square block. If you sew side-to-side -side blocks, that's a straight set. This, to me, in my opinion, is just a block or a unit of a block. Deb Tucker calls it square squared. Jody Barrows, remember, she called it square in a square. Doreen Speckman, the late, great Doreen Speckman, called it a center diamond. If you go to Barbara Brackman's book, you will see she has five additional, five additional names for this block here. I'm not gonna spend the time reading them all to you. Also, this square and a square unit can be a part of another block. Here it is in this block, here it again in the center of this block, and a square and a square and a square in this block. So putting triangles around a block does not make it a diagonally set quilt. To make it a diagonally set quilt, rather than sew side to side and lay them across like we did last week with the double Irish chain and the um, curved log cabin, these are diagonal rows that require triangles on either side. Now this is the grape basket block that I showed you in our on point videos. And if you take this, this grape basket block and set it side by side, all the grape baskets are on their side. I wouldn't do that. I would take this block and set it on point. Now to see a diagonally set quilt, I've got this diagram for you, and here you can see it needs four corner triangles, and it needs side setting triangles, the number of which is dependent on how many blocks you use. If you take the grape basket block and put it into a diagonal set, instead of being on its side, it's pointing straight up. Now that doesn't mean that you can't take a square block and add four corners to it and put it together, sew it straight across. This is a straight set quilt, and it gives the appearance with these triangles from the corners of the block, gives the appearance of an alternate block. In my opinion, it's easier to just set it on point with an alternate block. So here's your first row. You've got two side setting triangles here and a corner triangle here. Block, alternate block, block, and you've got the two side setting triangles here, corner block here, and so on. You don't have to have an alternate block, but this is one whole piece rather than four triangles coming together. To me, this is a better way to do it. You can also not do an alternate block and just fill in every single one with your grape basket. And as far as math goes on this, 
There's charts for it. I'm going to tell you in just a moment where you can print out charts for the corner triangles and side setting triangles and how you'll know how big your quilt is based on the size of your block. Let's get to the episode. Now for the fun part, quilters math. I promise it's easy. There are certain numbers that are important to quilters. A half, seven eighths, one and a quarter, and good old 1.414. Let's start at the beginning. The first number you probably learned was a half an inch. You all know this. I'll just repeat it real quickly. A quarter plus a quarter seam allowance on either side of a square or a strip gets you that half inch. If you need a block to finish to five, you need to cut a five and a half inch square. Simple. The next number is seven eighths. If you need half square triangles to finish to five, you have to cut five and seven eighths. And that being said, I never cut eighths. I would cut six and trim it down to five actually five and a half before it goes into the block. Next number, one and a quarter. That is the measurement you need to know if you're making quarter square triangles or hourglass units. If you need this to finish to five, you cut six and a quarter. That being said, I would cut six and a half and trim down. Why do you need to know these? Because in my opinion, most patterns are not written well. I think every pattern should say, as you build your block, now your piece should measure whatever it should measure. And those numbers are often left out. If you know the math, if you've known you've cut half square triangles at five and seven eighths, you know your unit is going to be raw edge to raw edge five and a half and finish to five so that you then can always check as you're going that your block is the correct size. The next measurement is 1.414, and that measurement is the diagonal measurement across the block. Now, don't get too worked up over this measurement. Um, you'll only use it a few times here and there. Uh, an example is if you there's a diagonally set quilt that you love the pattern, but it's either too gigantic or too small, and you want to make more blocks. You just need to calculate how big the block is across by multiplying the block size by 1.414, and that will tell you how many um, blocks across you're going to want. Now that measurement is also used in conjunction with the one and a quarter and the seven eighths to get the side setting triangles and corner square triangles that we talked about in the previous section, um, the diagonally set quilts. But again, you don't need to worry about this because there's charts. Your side setting triangles are one and a quarter bigger, uh, one and a quarter bigger, and your corner squares are seven eighths. But you don't need to know it because there's charts available. If you go to fatquartershop.com, you can download this PDF from Kimberly and she gives you the corner square triangles and side setting triangles for diagonally set quilts. And she also gives you what Kimberly cuts because she's like me, she cuts things bigger and trims down. You can also go to quiltville.com and that's Bonnie Hunter's website and she also gives you a chart for side setting triangles and corner triangles for diagonally set quilts and what's nice about hers is she gives you examples so if there's a block size you're making that's not here it's some strange size in between you could just follow her example and you'll be able to easily come up with the numbers you need. So no reason to fret about those measurements. Now, let's move on to calculating borders, bindings, and backings. And in all cases, think 40. 
Y40. It's a little bit less than the full width of fabric. If you did 42 and a half or 43, no wiggle room built in. You'll be able to build in some wiggle room if you use 40. And it's also easier number than 42 and a half. So as an example, say you want to add a three inch border and your quilt is 48 by 60. You add up the perimeter of the quilt, which would be 48 plus 48 plus 60 plus 60, and make it easy on yourself. Use the calculator. You've got one on your phone. It's 216 inches. Take your 216 inches and divide by 40, and that gives you 5.4. Now, you're not going to cut 4 tenths of a, a strip, so you round up, you're going to cut six strips. You take six times 3.5, which is the three we said, plus your half an inch seam allowance. So you multiply by 3.5, you get 21 inches. The next, the measurement for that would be five eighths of a yard, because that's 22 and a half inches. Uh, although if I had somebody in the shop, I would probably say, get two thirds of a yard or three quarters of a yard. So just in case you have a slip, you get one miscut, you can still have enough for your border. And the binding, then you do the same. If you had the same size quilt and I was doing a binding, most of my customers cut their binding strips two and a half. So you'd multiply six by two and a half for binding for this size quilt. I cut mine two. So I would say two times six is 12, and that's a third of a yard. But if it were a customer, I'd want them to go home with three eighths or a half a yard just in case they make one miscut. Now, one word of caution, as you're joining your binding strips or your border strips, you lose the amount of inches that's the width of the fabric. So as you're joining these three and a half inch strips, you're losing three and a half inches. Well, you rounded up from 5.4 to six and you used 40 instead of maybe 42. So you're probably going to be fine. But say for example, you're doing an eight inch border or a 10 inch border. If you do a 10 inch border and you join those diagonally, you're losing 10 inches or 25% of the strip practically. So I would um, probably not even do a 10 inch border or an eight inch border or 12 inch border, but if I did, I would join them just straight across and not do diagonally because you lose way too much fabric. Now let's talk about calculating yardage for backings. Assuming you're not using a 108 wide back and you're piecing it, you need to calculate how much fabric you're going to need. Now. In my example here, I'm saying I need 66 by 78, but you have to know how much extra you need for who's ever quilting the quilt. If you're quilting it on a domestic machine, you might only need four inches extra. I ask for six inches extra, three on each side for my long arm. There's long armors who ask for eight. There's long armors who ask for 10. So you have to calculate the size of your quilt plus whatever the long armor or whatever you need to quilt it yourself. So in my example, I'm using 66 by 78. And again, you think 40. What number is closest to 40 without going over? And it, in this example, it's 78, which means your 40, your width of fabric is going to be the length. So you need two widths of fabric 66 inches long. So how much yardage is that? 66 times two is 132, divide by 36, and that gets you to three and two thirds. So if I had a customer in the store, I'd probably say bump it up to three quarters just for a little bit of wiggle room, but three and two thirds would be sufficient for this. Now in my next example, I'm giving you one that's the, like the most difficult to um, figure out. And that is where you're not close to 40 and you're not close to 80. It's you're kind of in the middle. 
So in my example here, I'm doing 54 by 66. What's closest to 40 or 80 without going over? And it would be your 66. So you need two widths of fabric that are 54. So 54 times two is 108 divided by 36 is three yards. Now here, you only need 26 inches of this width of fabric. So this becomes waste. And what I do normally in this case is I use this for binding so it doesn't become waste. But over the years, we've tried all kinds of different uh, methods of adding a little bit more um, yardage from one width of fabric and trying to piece it into this piece. And it takes so much mental thinking and it ends up not saving enough fabric for as much time as it takes to figure it out and sew it on. So you're really, to me, in my opinion, better off using that for binding or ending up in your um, strip pile for scrap quilts. Now the next example is needing 78 by 96. So what's my closest to 40 or 80 without going over? And it's going to be your 78. Gets you 40 and 40 will get you the width of fabric. So in this case, instead of being pieced horizontally like these, this one's going to be pieced vertically. So how much yardage do you need? You need two pieces 96 inches long. So 96 times 2 is 192 divided by 36 is five and a third yards. And again, for a little wiggle room, if it were a customer, I'd probably say get five and a half, but five and a third is sufficient for this. So whether it's backings, bindings, borders, always think in terms of 40 and multiples of 40 to be able to easily calculate your yardage. And if you don't wanna do that, go back to the fatquartershop.com and Kimberly has a reference chart for making piecing backings. And she does it, they're a little generous in the measurement, so you'll always have enough, but you don't have to go through the math if you don't want to. Lastly, I'd like to share with you probably the most valuable thing you'll walk away from this tutorial, and that is Always do your math without the seam allowance, and then you add it back in at the end. What's a real life example that you might need to use this? I've got an example here of quilt blocks at five inches square with sashing of two inches. And in this, you've got sashing here and cornerstones here. Let's say you've decided you don't want cornerstones. How long do you need to cut this strip? Now it's just one piece. Don't get confused. Leave the seam allowance off as you add. So you're going to add five, five, five is 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Add the half in at the end. This piece is 19 and a half inches long. Easy. It's important to know these numbers for if you're making strip sets of various lengths, or various widths, excuse me, various widths to make sure that they're the right measurement. So when you're adding a two and a half inch strip, two one and a half inch strips, and a three inch strip, how wide should that be? Always do your math without the seam allowance. So the two and a half becomes two, the one and a halves become one, and the three becomes a two and a half. Then you can add the half an inch on, measure, and make sure that your strip sets are the right width. If your pieces are always the right size, then your quilts will come together beautifully. So don't let the seam allowance mess you up. Once they're sewn in here, they have disappeared. So always do your math without the seam allowance and add the seam allowance back in at the end.
I wanted to share this quilt with you today because it is all made up of scraps up until I get to the borders. This again, as from last week, I love the barn raising setting. This is the way the pattern was written, although it has a different border. It's from American Patchwork and Quilting. It's April 2019, and I did go on their website, allpeoplequilt.com, and I'm not sure if you can get the pattern, but it gives you all the lessons about the pattern there. But in this quilt, I used both little scraps to make the two and a half by one and a half inch pieces and I used strip sets from my pre-cut uh, scrap strip pile and I was just very pleased with how it turned out and I just wanted to share it with you today. So I'd like to thank all of you for watching. If you have any questions please put them in the comment section or message me on Instagram at Quilters Have an Ink. We're also trying to put together a Zoom class for the Light in the Valley quilt. And if you have any interest in that, please let me know. Uh, we haven't quite figured out the format yet, but um, we'd like to know if there is interest, if people would like to learn how to make that quilt. So until next time, Happy sewing, happy quilting. See you next time.